Hey everybody, Mrs. Bodishan here. So today we're going to be talking about reactivity of elements on the periodic table. But first we need to understand how they're classified. So we can organize them based off of their physical and chemical properties into these areas, metals, non-metals, and metalloids. And you kind of need to know where to find them. So if you look, you're going to see that our metals are all of our yellow elements on here. If we have this little zigzag line or the staircase as it's called, um, you'll see it in a bold black line usually on your periodic table. To the left of that is really where your metals are going to be with the exception of hydrogen. So on the right hand side of that zigzag line are going to be your non-metals, all of these in green with the addition of hydrogen being a non-metal, okay? Um, and then right at the zigzag line, touching it or on it, is going to be our metalloids. And that's where you can easily identify them. And those are our purple elements. Let's talk a little bit further about each one now. So we're gonna talk about metals first. So they form cations, which are positive ions when they bond. They are lustrous, which means they're incredibly shiny. They are gonna be solid at room temperature with the exception of mercury that is a liquid. They're great conductors of heat and electricity and they are malleable, which means we can pound them into thin sheets and they're ductile, which means we can draw them into a wire um, and they're gonna have very high melting and boiling points. And here's just a couple examples. Of course, there's lots more on the periodic table. So I just wanted to show you up close, malleable, you guys, is kind of like um, tin foil, how it is pounded into that thin sheet. Ductile is kind of like how we draw out copper into a thin wire. And then luster, you're going to look for the shine on it. All right, moving on to nonmetals. So they form anions when they bond, which are negative ions. They're going to be dull, so not shiny, not lustrous. Um, they're going to be liquid or gas at room temperature, and they're very poor conductors of heat and electricity. In other words, they're really good insulators. They are brittle and they're flaky, um, and they're going to have very low melting and boiling points. And here's just a couple examples for you. So brittle, what I mean by that is they're going to break easily. So they're going to kind of crumble in your hand and kind of be flaky. Um, insulators. We use insulators for a lot of things, but it's usually to protect us from either um, heat or electricity. We'll stop it from um, touching our skin and burning us or electrocuting us. And then dull is just going to be the opposite of shiny, so it kind of looks flat, right? Metalloids are the ones at the staircase, remember, or the zigzag line. And they're going to look like metals, but they behave a lot like non-metals. So they're kind of in between a little bit of both going on. Um, they're going to be shiny or lustrous to the look. They're going to be brittle, though, which is kind of weird for, you know, something that looks like a metal to be brittle because that is a trait of a non-metal. Um, it's going to be an intermediate when it's talking about transferring heat and electricity. In fact, we call them semiconductors. So they can conduct electricity and heat, but just not as well as a metal can, okay? Um, so we use them for a lot of special applications, especially in electronics. And they are found on the zigzag line. All right, so now we're gonna head into reactivity now that we know the basics of the classifications. So notice we've kind of split up the periodic table into two different directions here, right? So our metal reactivity is going to increase as we go over to the left and then down. So in other words, I can just draw an arrow going down to the left-hand corner, right? My non-metals are going to increase going up and over to the right. In other words, I can just draw an arrow going up to that right-hand corner. Uh, now notice I have grayed out my noble gases and that's because noble gases have a full octet or that full outer valence shell so they're not going to be very reactive at all in fact we call them inert gases because they do not tend to react at all they have no need to they have a full outer shell they're good to go all right metal reactivity trends so when we're talking just about metals you guys as we go across the period to the left so that's the row we're talking about, okay? Across that row, elements become more likely to react because they have less electrons to give away. So they're just gonna have fewer amounts. They don't have very many to give away. They're not gonna react so much. 
And then as we go down a period, so as we go down rows in the periodic table, the radius of the atoms are gonna get larger. So we're gonna start getting bigger atoms. The bigger the atom, the easier it is to take away an electron from them because the electrons are farther away from those positive protons in the nucleus. So they can kind of be snatched up a lot easier. Okay, so I have a size diagram here and you can see that in the upper right hand corner, we have the very smallest elements from the periodic table. And then as we go down diagonally to the left bottom, we have the very largest atoms off the periodic table. Now, if we think about this, you guys, protons and electrons are opposite, right? Positives and negatives, so they're gonna attract one another. If you get an atom that has the electrons really close to the nucleus with those positive protons, they're gonna be pulling it in and it becomes a little bit smaller and a lot less likely for those electrons to leave, right? Because there's more attraction going on. If you have a larger atom, it's gonna be a lot easier for those electrons that are far away from the nucleus to be lost because there's not as much attraction, especially if there's multiple layers, multiple shells within your atom, multiple energy levels, because now you have other negative electrons and it creates a shielding effect because those electrons don't like the other electrons because they're both negative and those repel, right? So the nucleus doesn't have quite as strong of a hold once it gets farther away and those are easier lost, okay? So let's switch gears and talk about our non-metal reactivity trends. We're gonna be talking right across the period, which is the row, okay? So elements, valence cloud becomes more filled with electrons, so then they become more greedy to fill their valence shell. In other words, as they get higher, like six, seven, whatever, they want to fill it to eight. Um, so it's gonna be like, um, a lot easier for them to go out there. They're gonna be reacting a lot quicker to make sure that they grab onto those other electrons and fill up to a full octet. So if we go up a period, which is up a row on the periodic table, the atomic radius gets smaller, which we just saw. Um, and the smaller the atom is, the, strong, the, the more strongly attracted it is to electrons, right? Because that nucleus is pulling those electrons, so it's gonna be a strong attraction there. So let's try this. Which of the following would be more likely to donate an electron? And which of the following would be more likely to gain an electron? Pause this video and we'll go over the answer in a second. Okay, here we go. All right, so I went ahead and I identified where our elements are and the ones that are gonna be the more likely to donate are going to be metals, right? Because metals tend to donate. If you look at the size, the larger it is, remember the farther away those electrons are, the valence ones from the nucleus, they're gonna get rid of them first. So potassium is definitely gonna go first and then sodium. Um, and then we can go over to the non-metals, which will, will be a lot less likely to be donating, especially these halogens right here. They have seven valence electrons. They don't really wanna donate at all, if we're honest. They wanna take one. So if we had to put them in order, we could say that chlorine is larger than fluorine, so chlorine would definitely be donating one before fluorine ever would, okay? Um, but these are highly unlikely to donate electrons. All right, which of the following nonmetals would be the most reactive and which of the following nonmetals would be the least reactive? Go ahead and pause your video and try this, and I'm going to give you the answer in just a second. All right, let's go ahead and check it out. So I went ahead and I identified where these are on the periodic table for you so you could see them. And I'm showing you the arrows. We're really looking at these blue arrows because they're all non-metals, so we don't really care about the metal side right now. So remember that it's going to go over to the right and then up, or we can draw that arrow at a diagonal to the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. It means the same thing, you guys. You'll see it on a test or quiz either way. And so therefore, we know if we're going from the more reactive to least reactive, it's definitely going to be fluorine being the very most reactive, and then chlorine, our halogens, will always come first, you guys. Um, and then we're going to go over to oxygen and then end up with sulfur. Um, so if that helps you at all, just remember halogens are definitely going to win out against the oxygen family any day, okay? Um, I hope this video was helpful for you guys. If you liked it, go ahead and click on that like button. Subscribe to my channel to see more. Thank you all for watching. Bye, everybody.